My name is Kim Sims and I'm the University Archivist at the College of William and Mary. I'm interviewing Van Black, a member of the William and Mary class of 1975. Today's date is July 17th, 2015, and the interview is being recorded in the Charles W. Reader Media Center's production studio and swim library at the College of William and Mary. The subject of today's interview is Van's experience as both an undergraduate and employee of William and Mary. So we're going to start off with some life history questions. Um, first, when and where were you born? Born in Philadelphia, <laughs> in August 25th, 1953. Did you grow up in Philadelphia? I grew up in the Philadelphia suburbs of South Jersey. And what years did you attend William & Mary? 71 to 75, and then worked here, 75 to 77. So what led you to apply to and attend the College of William & Mary? <laughs> I hated study hall in high school. It was like Animal House, spitballs, craziness. And I was probably a little more serious student than that. So I volunteered to work in the guidance office and basically looked at every college catalog that they had while I worked in the guidance office. And there was only one school that appealed to me and that was William & Mary. Mm -hmm. Part of it was the sense of history Part of it was that I thought I was going to be a lawyer, had the oldest law school in the country. At, to me at that time, old equated good if it's still around. And another part of it was I was a pretty conservative, straight-laced, probably still am in a way, kind of person. And during all the turbulent 60s, um, when I was in high school, We Mary seemed to be pretty calm. And like I wanted an education that wasn't full of all that craziness. So all those factors. Plus it was in the South, it was warmer. And so when you say craziness, what does that mean? Ah, protests and you know, I was pretty conservative in a world that was pretty liberal at the time. So when you moved to Williamsburg, did you experience, um, or what was that experience like moving to Williamsburg from South Jersey? Did you experience you know, culture shock? A little bit. It wasn't, it wasn't too much. Um, things that hit me the most was like when it snowed, people would have brooms <laughs> on Duke and Gloucester Street. I said, have you ever heard of a shovel? <laughs> have you ever heard of a snowplow? <laughs> um, but culturally, um, really not a big difference. Um, and being on my own, basically not a difference because I'd been an exchange student in high school. I used to go to camps in the summer, so not, not a lot of drama. Um, biggest transition was really I was surrounded by much smarter people than me and much smarter people than I'd ever been exposed to on a daily basis. That was probably the biggest transition for me, but not North South, not Jersey, Virginia, not too much. People made fun of my accent all the time. <laughs> but. Um, so you were a very active undergraduate and we'll get into specifics soon. But at this time, I'd like for you to tell me what made it, motivated you to be so engaged. Actually, because I wasn't succeeding academically, I, I struggled here um, academically. I was way out of my leg here. And that's a story later in this conversation about how I found out that I got in here. But um, I was incredibly active in high school, and that was my normal mode. But my freshman year, basically, I just studied and did not get results that <laughs> were very satisfying. So at the end of my freshman year, I ran for honor council. One, because you didn't have to publicize. Two, I was going to be a lawyer. And so being able to get that experience of doing honor council was a good one. And three, I was running unopposed, so like I knew I would get a chance to do it. Um, so that was my first and only involvement, really, until my junior year. And then because I wasn't really getting out of William & Mary what I hoped because my academic performance was, you know, we're talking everything is B's and C's, you know. I didn't get an A. I don't think I got it. I only got two A's the whole time I was here. Balance that with an F. Um, but I wanted something more. I loved the people, but I just wasn't feeling like I was getting out of college what I wanted to be, so I started getting a lot more engaged. Honor, um, continued honor council kinds of things, dorm council, and that's what opened the door to lots of other engagements. So what made you stick it out then at William & Mary if you didn't feel you were you know, measuring up academically to your classmates? 
Um, just the inner, I'm not going to quit kind of thing. You know, when I work with students here all the time, I see <laughs> so much of myself and I can really empathize with their experience. You know, I'm like an overachiever, I'm used to being an overachiever and I'm not going to quit until I figure out how to do this. And so part of it, you know, now that I'm older and I have work in a field that talks about competencies and strengths and assessments and things like that, I realized without knowing it that um, I just started playing to my strengths, things I was good at, things I knew I'd be um, successful, things I knew I would enjoy where I could make a difference. And so I plotted along on the academic sense and really thrived on the engagement sense. We would call it engagement now, but you know, in involvement, student involvement, student leadership, those kinds of things. Um, so how did you find out you got into William Mary? Oh, God. Uh, my senior year, um, Harriet Reed, who ended up being a lifelong friend, was in admissions and she contacted me and a whole bunch of other people saying that the admissions office was going to experiment with doing, I'm um, taking students with them to do interviews and specific, um, to interview high school students, specifically at private schools. And I was, I was on the list of people and <laughs> she interviewed me and said, I only have two questions. What do you like about William Mary? And what don't you like? And I said, okay, where do you want to start? And she said, what do you like? said, the people are great. I love the campus. It's beautiful. I can't think of anything else. I had had a really bad day. I have no idea why, but I, had, I was in a really bad mood. And she said, what don't you like? And I went on, <laughs> probably for an hour. <laughs> and at the end, I said, well, we'll never see each other again, but thanks. That felt good to vent. <laughs> I feel better. And I said, could you ask, can you find out, how did I get in here? Really, I've struggled. And... I look around, these people are remarkable and smart, how did I get in? So she pulled my file. And bottom line, long story short, um, I was an exchange student in high school. And the admissions office had, um, had just received some kind of predictive study about correlation between high school record and success at William & Mary. Defined like graduating in the top half of your class in four years or something like that. And I had been an exchange student as a sophomore when typically in, in at least our area, you went as a junior, to I was the leader of the American delegation to Brazil. So I was in charge of a group of students. And she said, um, all of those things because of the predictive study outweighed my board scores. And um, you know, my grades were great and I was a leader in everything, but you know, board scores weren't great. And uh, she said, so, the notes made a comment about may struggle academically, but will be a leader on campus. I went, whoa, that is credibility to the <laughs> admissions process. <laughs> but yeah, I guess exchange student is really how I, I got here. Okay, so some of the activities you engaged in include serving on the Honor Council, which yeah, you mentioned, yeah. and serving as the editor of the Green and Gold, <laughs> oh, which, yeah. as I understand, is... Um, it's like the freshman book. It's freshman all the pictures, book, right. yeah. <clears throat> and so, um, and you were also really active in residence hall life, yeah. such as serving as a resident assistant, serving on the dorm council, and inter hall. So I have yeah, yeah. a series of questions related sure. to that. Sure. Um, so one, what are some of your favorite memories of working with the honor council? What did you, what did you learn um, from serving on the honor council? Honor council for <laughs> me was the most um, important experience I had here in the sense that. I learned more about myself and having to deal with difficult situations with peers, um, you know, wanting to be a lawyer at the time or, you know, having to interpret, you know, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law and where universities fit into that context versus the civil world. Um, and it was really hard to, you know, sit and listen and try to ferret out what's fact and what's fiction the credibility of people, the read of people. It was very enlightening um, and, and very difficult, but very rewarding. Um, so that, that experience um, really opened my eyes to a lot of things, and especially about myself. And I was only on a, officially on Honor Council for the one year because the next year and when 
Title IX themes came, it became open. There wasn't a men's council and a women's council. It was just open election, and I did not get elected. Um, but because people have to recuse themselves, there are so many times when on our, you know, trials would come up that um, people knew people. So I was always the go-to person you know, to fill the first open spot. So um, except for one or two people, I sat on more honor trials during my We Mary time than honor council people did. So that continue and that personal revelation continued you know, throughout so my whole time. What specifically did you learn about yourself? Um, how to separate um, fact and fiction, how to probe whether somebody's being real and authentic. Um, being able, as I mentioned, the, the spirit of the process versus the letter of the process, extenuating circumstances of how that factors into whatever kind of judgment came by. Um, just reading people, I think, helped a lot. And it ended up being the career I had involving all those things. And RA and Honor Council both, you know, both really helped me in that regard. So would you say that is what made it rewarding then, what you learned about yourself? Um, what I learned about myself is probably the primary, and the secondary is probably, I think that I learned an ability to get other people to listen and see those things. It just wasn't that I learned it, but I would ask the kinds of questions or not be afraid to say, eh, now look at it from this perspective. Um, and I think that was helpful to other kind of people who were on our council with me. So can you describe the purpose of both the dorm council and interhall? Uh, dorm council's um, probably easier one to describe. Each residence hall still has a hall council of elected representatives from their residence halls, floors, or whatever. And they manage um, policy and practice within the halls. Primarily programming, at least that's what it was then, programming. Um, so activities with the dorm, educational, social, recreational programs. And when I was on dorm council, it was Bryan Complex, which is five dorms. And ultimately the dorm I ended up working for, managing full time. Um, so it was five dorms. So some were male dorms, some were female dorms. Some, When I was on dorm council, they were all male or female. We didn't have any co-ed until later. So, you know, the men had a different perspective than the women did about what they wanted to do from a social and recreational standpoint. You know, if there was damage in the dorm, you talked about what we were going to do about that. So it was, um, it was a, really a, a fun activity. I got elected dorm council president because I left a meeting when they were having an election. <laughs> they said, oh, Vail will do it. Get Vail to do it. And that's how I got elected dorm council president. But it, um, yeah, it, was a, it was a really fun experience. And it got, you know, it got me to know an awful lot of people throughout Bryan Complex, which was all upperclassmen. What about Inner Hall? Inner Hall is something I um, helped create. Right now there's an organization on campus called RHA, Residence Hall Association, and this is pretty much the original precursor of that. Um, it, Paul Jost is the person who had the main idea. And Inner Hall was an organization like Student Assembly, except focused specifically on improving the residence halls, sharing best practices in the residence halls, policies and practices within the residence halls. So it was a subset of student affairs. And when I was a junior, yeah, I was a junior, uh, was the first time they ever had a dean of residence halls. So he brought an awful lot of practice, structure, infrastructure, programming, a guy named Morris Ray. Um, and that's when I started working with um, him and the residence hall staff to say, residence halls aren't going to get the attention from student government. There's no process for it. It's all new. We should have some form of representation. But it was pretty much programming. You know, it really didn't get into policy and practice much. Dean Ray would ask us our opinion about stuff, but it was primarily programming, sharing ideas across the organization. So um, what are some of your favorite memories of working with these groups in terms of you know, accomplishments or what you're most proud of or you, know, you think you're... You know, more of, it came, more, of it, um, more of the positive memories um, probably came when I was the area director of those groups. But some of them during 
um, my undergraduate days were we used to have um, with Jefferson, which was an all-female dorm, we used to have an annual heart dance and a fundraiser for um, you know the Red Cross. We started having um, volleyball tournaments that ended up being campus-wide when I was an area director. Um, one of the most fun, though, was bringing President Graves and Mrs. Graves into the residence halls for dinner, <laughs> which um, Sam Sadler says it wasn't the first time, but it, it was one of the first times, he says. But, you know, we had dinner on ping pong tables. We're in the basement, you know, of this you know, old dorm, and now it's 40 years older. But we just had, you know, invited them to uh, dinner and then another time to another social function that we had. And they were new things, they were different things. It was wonderful for him as well as it was, you know, wonderful for students. Because like President Reevely now is all over the place and he's a rock star and everybody knows those people. But um, 40 years before, you know, you had to sort of do more inviting to make sure, you know, that you built that relationship. Okay. So in the spring of 74, you were elected senior class president. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. For the 1974-75 academic year. Yeah, yep. Um, and it wasn't exactly an, an, what we would call an easy road to victory with the flat hat edi editorial um, <laughs> stating that you were, in effect, too nice of a guy to be the class president. Yeah. So a few questions regarding that time Yeah, nice period. guys finish last. <clears throat> yeah, starting off with what, what made you decide to run for senior class president? I was a last, you know, toward the last minute entry because I never really thought of doing it before. A couple of the guys on second floor of CAM where I was the RA um, just said, you know, you could do this. I said, well, I know I could do it, but I could never get elected. You know, I don't know that many people outside of here. Um, but what people don't know, and I don't think I've shared with more than one or two people ever, was that I needed something to keep me at William & Mary. Because I was, I was all prepared to, to leave school at the end of my junior year. I was just so burned out and so, so miserable. At that time, I was thinking, I'm still going to go to law school, and I'm never going to get into law school with these grades. Um, so I, I was just really having a lot of time, and that's part of my reference to understanding some of the stresses that, that students here feel now that I do coaching with. But I needed something that would bring me back. And being an RA, I loved, but it wasn't enough. I love the people, it wasn't enough. So it was a long shot, it was like a Hail Mary pass. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll run. <laughs> and I knew I could do a great job if I got elected, but I didn't anticipate being elected. And so then, a week later, the Flat Hat writes an article, uh, an editorial saying, nice guys finish last and says I'm the most competent and hardworking of the candidates, but I'm too much of a gentleman and a slight bit too compromising you know, to deal with administrators. And I was really honked off because I thought, not only am I not gonna win, now I'm <laughs> probably not gonna get any votes. And that's mean, um, that's just plain old mean and they don't even know me. So I wrote a letter to uh, people in the Bryan complex where I lived and was the RA, because that's the only people I really you know, knew other than people from classes who lived elsewhere, and just said, hey, there's, uh, I, I just think this is unfair, and here's some data to show you situations where I've stood up for things we need to do, a dorm council one in particular, and um, somehow or another, um, I won on the first, <laughs> first ballot. We used to have what was called alternative voting um, during that era, where for student government offices, and elections, you had to rank candidates, and you had to have a majority. So like for SA president, when Sharon and Dave were running, um, it's only two people, so somebody's gonna get more than somebody else. For us, we had ended up with five candidates, because there was a person even after me who ran. And so to get to a majority was gonna be like an all-night, and this is paper ballots, this is not technology, um, but somehow, in, another, I won on the first ballot and they didn't have to go through all that exercise. And my feeling is that the editorial probably drove my friends in Bryan Complex 
to go and vote who might normally not have other voted. Like, this guy's getting screwed. Um, and so then I had to do something about it because I won. The really funny thing, though, is, uh, you know, at that time we only had, like, one phone on the hallway. And there's no cell phones. There's no technology. And um, I got a call from WCWM radio station and mo man, you know, monitoring the elections that they said, well, we only have one precinct reporting and you're in last place. So it just confirmed to me that, you know, I wasn't going to win. And so I went off to swim to study, allegedly. And um, by the time I got to swim, people were congratulating me. And I said, I'm in last place. That's the, <laughs> what are you talking about? They said, no, no you won. I said, yeah, that's not possible. And I really, I just thought it was somebody being funny or mean. <laughs> so then everybody started congratulating me. And I said, well, what are you talking about? So I called. And they said, oh, no, you won. I said, how'd that happen? And what do I do now? And they said, well, that's yours to figure, <laughs> that's yours to figure out. So, yeah, that's how I got elected senior class president. Um, but, you know, in some ways, you know, you believe in divine intervention or some things happen for reasons. Um, it, it kept me at William Mary. I would have, it would have been a terrible mistake in my life, and my folks would have killed me on top of it. Uh, everybody in my family would have killed me if I had done that. Um, but yes, things happen for reasons, I think. And, well, but st staying connected <clears throat> is a derivative of, you know, that time at William Mary. So in your response to the editorial, you gave an example of how you, in fact, were not willing to compromise. Oh, with the Board of Visitors. With the Board of Visitors. Yeah. Um, so could you repeat that story for this purpose and also um, you know, provide some more examples of, of maybe how you prove the, prove, prove the flat hat wrong in your time as uh, a prove, uh, Well, I think I'm still pretty nice. Um, but the Board of Visitors had made a decision, like the Architectural Committee or something like that, um, well, I was dorm council president, so during my junior year, that they were going to rename the complexes on campus, like Bryan Complex, Botetot, things that had multiple buildings. And they were going to name them like Bryan, A, B, C, D, E, Botetot, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And I thought, that's a terrible idea. And it just didn't seem to be part of William Mary, like, historical presence. You know, there's college presidents and U.S. presidents, these dorms are named up, the history, and that's part of William Murray's culture. So I thought it was a really bad idea. So of course, you know, we were big on petitions in those days. <laughs> we had petitions for everything. Um, so I got a petition in the dorm council and went to, um, took it to President Graves and said, you know, here's our stance on this one. We really think this is a bad idea. And um, how do we get the Board of Visitors to change it? And that's the first time I ever met President Graves. And he um, told me the process that we would go and raise the issue, but we would not ask them to make a decision on the spot because that's not how it worked. Ask them to reconsider it. Next meeting, they'll come back and give a response. And of course, I'm, I've always been like, well, why? <laughs> help me understand. No, I would say, help me understand. No, I just say, why? And uh, he said, well, that's really how the process works. And, you know, I, I got it, but. In my head, I went, this is a stupid process, just like changing the names. So um, three of us, Wyatt Bethel was one of them. I forget who the other person was. Three of us um, went to the board meeting. We were sitting in the hall waiting to be called in. And it was late and late and later. You know how agendas run. And so we figured, eh, we're never going to get in there. And finally, somebody opened the door and said, one of you can come in. We're running late. Been a long day. And and like why and the other person put, well, you're going in. <laughs> I said, okay. So they said, really, you know, we've read your, you know, petition or read your statement or whatever, but really what's, you know, what's this all about? Uh, and I had prepared notes about history and all the, all the things like if you were given a speech, he would be prepared to talk. <laughs> and all that came to my mind was, you know, when we have water battles, in Brian Complex, it's going to be so confusing. <laughs> a versus E versus, there's like no identity around that. And luckily, a couple of people started laughing and turned to each other and said things like, well, you know, we all went to college, too. Never really thought of it that way. Um, and by acclamation, should we just keep, like, that was it. 
So, you know, the good part is I stood up and I followed through and I took action. The bad part, I wasn't very sophisticated or <laughs> very polished in, in how I did it, but we got, we got the result. Um, but really, that's sort of who I've been since I was a little kid. In elementary school, high school, lots of examples of just, hey, that's what's going on here? That doesn't seem fair. Here's what we should do. Uh, and I don't know. It's probably from my parents' upbringing and the modeling they did for me in my life. But uh, I really, really haven't changed much in that regard. Frank, you ran out of it's time. A, it's a, yeah, it's a um, blessing and a curse. But I probably haven't changed a bit from, from that. No, because you ran on a platform of service. Service of, and depoliticizing. And, um, of course, that plays into, again, staying yeah. connected and the role of staying connected. Yeah, the purpose of staying connected. Absolutely. So, um, the political part, though, was a big part. Because um, my first act as senior class president was I withdrew from the student government. I withdrew the senior class from the student government. And they said, well, you can't do that. And I said, well, I'm a government major. I read the Constitution. <laughs> There's nothing that prevents me from doing it. And the purpose was, and the, the platform that I had, was to depoliticize things and concentrate on service. And it didn't seem fair that I, who was only representing the senior class, would be voting on college-wide matters. And it also was a symbolic gesture to be able to allow the focus on service. And so, you know, they said, no, you can't do that. And um, next meeting they came back and said, yeah, well, we read it, and I guess you can't do it. Yeah. Just like Interhall. When Interhall got started, um, Paul Jost, who was a junior, he's, or he was a year behind me, he's the one who had the main idea about Interhall, and he worked closest with Dean Ray. But Paul presented it to Interhall, and he had a very um, polarizing sometimes personality brilliant guy, um, passionate, but he, he could be really polarizing and some of the people really were offended by his approach because he sort of took it as a, you don't meet our needs, so we need our own organization to meet our needs. And I really believed in this idea of Interhall. And um, so I was just watching this meeting as an observer going, this is going down the tubes. So I just raised my hand and said, you know, you've given us a lot of really good things to think about. In the back of my head, I'm saying, there is nothing <laughs> they're saying that has anything to do with the value of this idea. It's really a relationship issue here. And so could we table it for a week? Let us consider your input, and then we'll come back and, and try to describe it in a way that, you know, you'll support. And they said, okay. And then the main thing was, Paul you can run this whole thing, but I need to give the presentation. And I gave the exact same presentation a week later <laughs> that Paul gave the prior week. It was like unanimous, okay, let's go do this. But that ties back to those Honor Council comments about just being able to read you know, the audience and understand what you're going for in the bigger picture. And you know, I ended up making a career out of, a career out of consulting in those regards. So. So what um, changes did you initiate as senior class president other, in addition to withdrawing from yeah, student government? I, the biggest ones were um, president's aides, who are student advisors to the president. Um, Sharon Pandek, who was the SA president, and I went to President Graves and said, we think that if you really want president's aides to be people who give you the pulse of the college, then we need to change the process because everybody was there by appointed position and maybe some at large positions. And I'm not sure, I'm sure it's the administration appointed them somehow or another. But if you really want to listen to a broad array, we need sophomores, juniors, and seniors on there, not just primarily position holders who are often seniors at that time. And we need some diversity and we need some different groups to be represented. So Sharon and I proposed that we have people who represent the arts, athletics, because at the time athletics was a big controversy on campus, so let's have male and female athletics represented. Um, publications, instead of saying the flathead editor, the colonial editor, the, pick someone from publications, pick someone from the arts, pick someone from sports, have at least one junior, have at least one sophomore. 
and um, and Sharon and I said, we'll give up our spots. And he said, no, 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 you're not giving up your spots because if this doesn't work, you're going to be accountable. I said, okay. But I really wanted to do it, so I was really, really glad. And the process worked great. The, the value of the conversations, you know, it just wasn't the student-politician view. Um, it, it was really, pretty, pretty wonderful experience. So that was one thing. And the other thing that we did was, uh, well, one that didn't go so well, um, we changed homecoming. Um, there's a lot of things that we as students were the leaders on with administrative support, like homecoming graduation speaker, that now over the years has become leadership driven with student input. So it's flip-flopped a little bit. And it's probably just the times, you know, of accountability and litigation, litigious society, all those kinds of things probably have helped change that. But um, it was pretty cool to be able to like figure out who the graduation speaker was and uh, what we were doing about homecoming. But at homecoming, they used to have like two or three princesses from every class. You know, it was you know looks and personality kind of thing. It's not like it is now, which is more service kind of thing. And so one of my decisions about homecoming, which, which sororities were really upset about, was that we cut back the number of princesses so that there was like one from every class plus the homecoming queen. Incidentally, the homecoming queen is now on the Board of Visitors. <laughs> She's wonderful and still wonderful. Um, but, you know, sororities are like, that's part of our recruiting strategy that we had this many. Home I said, think about what that says. That's just the pain. <laughs> And uh, so that didn't go well, but they got over it pretty quickly. Thank goodness. Um, so that was a change. Uh, but the other, the other one was we went to uh, a committee system, basically. One around service, one around career development, one around commencement. And there were three other ones. Um, and had just volunteers from the class lead each of those. So I've always you know, pretty good, pretty good source of finding, you know, talent to do things. And, you know, I would attend lots of the meetings, but like Jonathan Lane commencement, he was, he did a fabulous job, you know, around commencement. And even though, because I reread the article, I hadn't seen it in 35 or 40 years, reread the article that was written about me looking back at my senior year as senior class president and saying, you know, I wish we had had more people involved. And it's a little different from my recollection, because my recollection is we had a lot of people involved, certainly more than historically. But I think it's, that statement was the overachiever William and Mary high standard person, like, wait a minute, we only had 150 people involved and we have 900 in the class. Why can't we have 800 people you know, involved? Yeah, that's probably what that was all about. And I think there are payoffs from those days to how successful our class has been able to have been connecting around the staying connected niche. I think there were some you know, seeds planted way back then about people committing to each other and to the college that you know, have really proven to last a long time. We have a pretty special bunch of classmates. Before I move on to the next question that I have I'm ready to ask, you mentioned just uh, a few moments ago um, when you were speaking about the presidential aides, uh, controversy with athletics. Would you go into detail about what you mean by that? Yeah, that was, um, you know, we came from a post-Vietnam era, and you know, when I mentioned when I was choosing colleges, you know, all the controversies on campus, and the hippies and the protests. Um, but our big, so we were a quieter time than that. I mean, the era was just a quieter time than that. And our big issue on campus was campus athletics. And there was a um, big controversy that was very polarizing from the standpoint of wanting to build a bigger stadium, wanting to expand the number of scholarships that were given to revenue producing sports. So basketball, men's basketball and um, football. And there was a lot of controversy, quiet protest on the president's lawn, you know, things like that about, wait a minute, it's so hard to get into William & Mary already. 
why would you take more spots away from deserving students? So the, the pushback was things like, well, look, we have you know, somebody on the football team who's Phi Beta Kappa, and we have really smart you know, athletes who go to William and Marie, and all of that is very true. But I think it was a matter of um, fairness in the sense of the student's perspective about William and Marie as a whole and seeing athletics as a part of William and Mary more than making it a bigger front part of William and Mary or the face of William and Mary. And it, it um, didn't, it really polarized people. The faculty was pretty much opposed to it. Uh, the alumni were pretty much all for it. And the student body, my guess would be 80-20 against it, maybe 70-30 against it. This is all recollection. Um, but the president's aides, President Graves, um, told the president's aides at one of our meetings that, and we had them in the attic of his house, so it was you know, sitting around sofas, comfortable, very conversational. It was really awesome. Um, he told us what he was getting ready to announce about his decision. And at that point, it was something like, in four years, the program needs to be self-funded by alumni contributions. We would say development now, things like that. It was something along those lines. And my question to President Gray is that even the athletes put their head down was, is it a little weird that four now, four years from now, all of us who are against this aren't going to be, be here to hold you accountable? for that decision? That just seems interesting timing. Like, why not five years? Or uh, and He just sort of smiled. He said, I can count on you for <laughs> questions like that. And, you know, I haven't changed. Um, but it was, it ended up, I, well, over time, I don't know what happened after that, but it's not self-funded and it's not, um, and we didn't increase things. And I think within the next year or two is when Yale and William and Mary went to Division Two at the time, or eventually became. There's been so many evolutions of how NCAA sports are run, and then Title IX came in at that time. So there were so many variables about how athletics were run here. But during our senior year, it was a lot of controversy about it, and people make fun of us when 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 I tell other people from other schools, I go. What do you mean? Weren't you protesting economics? And weren't you? <laughs> no, you were protesting athletics, and you were protesting whether or not you could have graduation outside instead of William and Mary Hall. And actually, Kim, that's that was another one that didn't work out. Uh, graduation was always commencement. I'm sorry, I have to use the right William and Mary language. Commencement was always outside in Rand Courtyard, and. For during our senior year, we were about at the maximum size that we and invited guests could squeeze into it. But for two or three years ahead of us, it rained on commencement, and they had to set up Weimar Hall and the Red Courtyard, which was expensive and irritating. And the year, class of 74, they told them, no, you are going to Weimar Hall. So, of course, our class wanted to be outside. And there's another one of those petitions. <laughs> and we successfully got the college to change its mind and allow us to have commencement outside. And it rained. And Nancy Turntine, who was president, a friend of mine, and was president the next year, class of 76, to this day just said, oh, we had no choice, no discussion anymore. It's going to be outside. But the fun part of that story, though, is, you know, again, one hall and a, I mean, one phone and all. People were calling me that morning. I know, I know it's raining, but we should still have it outside. So that, that was an easy argument, like, like, don't be ridiculous. But then, of course, if, you know, if, I think commencement might have been like at noon. And around 10.30 or so, after the call was made, we're going inside, the sun comes out and the phone calls continue. And people are saying, we will get our parents to help us. We'll dry all the seats. We'll... And you know, 
basically, I wanted to do the same thing. But I said, you know, let's be realistic. We are, the ship has sailed. We need to go inside. Or else postpone graduation until 2 or 3 o'clock. And I don't think too many people are going for that. And so, you know, I was like really, just really sort of bummed out about it. And from a personal standpoint, my grandparents, who um, their namesake, and they funded my time at William & Mary, other than things I had jobs and scholarships for, um, my family was in the biggest and longest lasting, lifelong lasting trouble of their lives. And they were not coming to commencement. The family was all like really stressed out. My dad was out. I mean, it was a terrible time in my family's life. And so all those kinds of things, um, plus I was speaking and I was nervous because I hadn't written a speech. <laughs> all those things were happening. And so I was pretty, pretty stressed out about graduation. So we're on stage. I mean, I'm sitting on stage. And President Graves turns around to me and said, this one's for you. And I thought, I have no idea what he's talking about. And he said, I have an announcement. This is not part of the program. But I wanted to let you know that it is pouring rain outside. And people cheered and all that stuff. And I thought, what does it's for you mean? And he tells me afterwards, it was beautiful. I just wanted to get you off the hook. <laughs> but, oh, you're so nice. What a nice man. Um, so, yeah, commencement, that was sort of wild. Well, keeping with the theme of commencement, then, you received the Sullivan Award. Yeah, probably the biggest shock of my life, commencement. yeah. commencement. So talk about that some. I was shocked. Um, I guess I always um, thought of myself as a leader. I never really thought of myself as, like, a service even though I talked about, like, we should do more service, I just never thought of myself as a service person. That was like Peace Corps. You know, I sort of had a narrowly defined view of Peace Corps. So the humanitarian, the service, you know, helpfulness, I know it was helpful. But I just never really thought of it. Um, and it's funny how your mind works, because in my mind, I had one or two people that I was really hoping would get it. And it's amazing how quick your mind works, because as soon as... I heard like words coming out of my mouth. My first reaction was, oh, so-and-so <laughs> didn't get it. And then I sort of realized that, wait a minute, I got it. This is, this is a little weird. And, you know, truly probably one of the most, um, the biggest shocks I've ever had in my life. I just never, ever would have thought it. Um, but it was in many ways one of those Kodak moments for me because I thought, wow, if the college believes in me this way maybe I should believe in me this way and it really um, it really had a personal effect on me and I went and read about Algernon Sidney Sullivan and thought well this guy's crazy I mean <laughs> he's like service to the full I'll never get there um, but the other thing it did again jumping forward 40 or 35 years is when we started staying connected that's one of our guiding principles is that the Sullivan Award principles are how we do business, you know, how we engage others, how we treat others. Um, so it's been a long lasting, but it was a shocker. So in retrospect, though, do you, can you go back and see um, parts of your life that you can understand how you got nominated and selected? I can. <clears throat> and I can, you know, it started making me. You know, I, I use the word reframing a lot, you know, reframing things that I did even in elementary school. Like when we had class gift um, in eighth grade, you always bought something tangible. You bought a flag or you bought a plaque or something. And I convinced our classmates with a lot of struggle to give money to CARE, which was a, I don't even know if they exist anymore, but it was a, you know, help underprivileged people. That was our class gift. It was like... This is stupid. You know, when I was in sixth grade, new math was the big thing in school. I don't even know what new math was, but it was a different kind of way of doing math. And I got it, and one of my best friends got it. So we went to the teacher and said, you know, a lot of people are, don't get it. Maybe it's easier for us kids to explain to each other than it is for you as the teacher to explain it. And I think, you know, looking back, I go, that's pretty ballsy to go to a teacher. We can teach math better than you. <laughs> I get the word ballsy a lot. Um, but so we came in early. We came in like a half hour, an hour before school, a couple days a week, and tutored our classmates. 
And the old me would have never thought of that as service. It would have been, well, we have an idea and we ought to do it. I just never really thought of it from a service standpoint. But I, I've got those little indicators probably my whole life and it's my whole family's way of the world. Just never really thought of it, you know, that way. And, and a really funny thing about this <laughs> solo award is the, the, the awards they give at commencement, still the Bodhisattva Medal, which is like academics, and then the Car Cup, which is leadership and academics. And, you know, I knew if, if it were purely a leadership award, hey, I'd be a good candidate for that. But Car Cup is academics and leadership. And I knew there was no prayer. That was going to happen. Um, but Elsa Didick, who was a German professor and was on a, was on a college-wide committee with me for foreign studies, um, she came to my dorm. And I went, what's a professor doing here? And she said, I need to talk to you about the commencement awards. And I said, OK. And she said, can I have your resume? And I said, I don't have a resume. But you know, I can list my activities or something if you want. And I said, but what's this for? And she said, you have no shot at it, but I want to nominate you for the car cup because I just want others to understand, you know, you know, good things that you did here. And I said, well, that's nice. So I did it. And here, what she had done was nominate me for the Sullivan Award. And you know, so I had no idea. She was cool. Yeah. Um, so we'll get back to something you, you briefly touched on to expand on war, which is uh, the time you spent as a president's aide to President Thomas Graves. Yeah. So um, when were you appointed? During the summer before my senior year. Okay. So and at that time, was it specifically? Seniors, yeah. and that's what senior class president you were trying to change was to. Yeah, so before me, it wasn't all seniors, but they were all appointed positions, or almost all of them were appointed positions. If you held this position on campus, you were a president's aide. So, essay president, senior class president, flat hat editor, colonial echo person. And we changed it to be more like functional areas of interest represented. So, the reason you were appointed is because you were senior class president, and then after your senior year, it started to. No, we changed it when I became senior class president. Okay. Sharon Pandak and I. Um, so during the junior year, during the summer break between junior and senior year, President Graves took Sharon and my recommendation to make it more functional, and so and, and asked Sharon and I to stay on the group. The bit about he wanted us to be accountable. So Sharon and I basically picked who the president's aides were, and um, you may have met one of them. I don't know if you remember Nancy McMahon from the archiving events. She comes, lives in Richmond. She was the person that we chose to represent the arts. She had, had leads in plays here. <laughs> I remember getting a, either a letter or a call from her saying, is this a joke? How did I? What is going on? I said, no, that's real. She goes, really? What am I supposed to do? I said, just be yourself. And just make sure that the people that you interact with from a theater standpoint and a choir standpoint, their views get represented. And this isn't like politics. It's like just like you know your friends and you know what you talk about every day. Just be able to talk about that. So, but yeah, we it was implemented so that during our senior year we had a sophomore, we had a junior, we had athletics, we had the arts represented. So I read an article last night from two thousand and nine, um, and I can't remember now if it was Virginia Gazette or another uh -oh. publication. But basically, the article was talking about kind of the mysteriousness of presidential, of the president's aides. Um, the mysteriousness of Yeah, like what exactly they're doing. Well, that's Where weird. President Reevely was quoted as saying, you know, they don't have any say in the actual running of you know, the college. It's basically they come have dinner with him once a month, and they talk about stuff, and he gets to know them, and it's great. Yeah. So from your experience, exactly what did you do as an aide? What did, what well, we had no, you know, we had no decision-making responsibility. I would look at it, if you translate it into corporate terms, as a focus group. It was like an ongoing focus group to make sure that the president had a sense of what the people on the street, you know, the students that he ultimately represents, that they felt about key issues on topic. So, you know, he would bring topics to us, we would bring topics to him. But, it, you know, there's no decision-making input. I mean, no decision-making, but there was plenty of input. 
And I'd say he was wonderful at really listening and being able to challenge us when, you know, you know, maybe we had opinions that we didn't have data or background or context. He was very good at, I would say, pushing back. But he had a, just a wonderful style about him that didn't feel like pushback, but just to let me help you understand another perspective. And we would do the same with him. Well, let me help you <laughs> understand another perspective. He was, he was a wonderful, still is, wonderful person. Well, since you worked closely with him as both uh, President Said and senior class president, what are some of your favorite memories of working with President Graves? Um, one, of the, one of the favorite and funniest is um, the graduation story that you know, I just told you about. Mm -hmm. um, another one was, you know, as it used to be, senior class president automatically was the student speaker at commencement. And my senior year, I didn't want to do it, and I didn't feel that was democratic. So I had the graduation committee do a poll of classmates. So they had little pallets and um, to vote for who should be senior class speaker or speaker at commencement. <laughs> and it backfired. <laughs> and I got, elect I got elected. And I said, yeah, but I don't want to do that. And they said, hey, you've already changed the process, and it's yours. Um, and I said, oh, God, what am I going to do? So I, I just, to this day, I hate public speaking. I can facilitate anything, but don't put me behind a podium. Um, so I was supposed to have my speech reviewed by President Graves before commencement, and as and like weeks before commencement, <laughs> and as of the night before commencement, when we were having our senior class parent student swing dance in the campus center ballroom, um, President Graves said. Uh, Matt, have you written your speech? I said, nope. And he said, just don't embarrass me. <laughs> just don't embarrass me. I said, I would never do anything to embarrass you. And he goes, maybe. Said, okay. And really, I, um, maybe an hour before commencement, in between all these calls about the rain, I wrote like three lines down. And we did have a surprise. It wasn't um, anything that President Graves would be upset about, I don't think. But um, part of our commencement committee's recommendation, a guy named Randy Gould, who was a classmate, was to honor Dr. Richard Silly, who was head of the Student Health Center. Because when we were freshmen, the health center was a part-time operation in a room in Hunt Hall. And Where? in Hunt, Hunt which is like across from that Barrett's restaurant. And by the time we graduated, we had the facility that exists right now, and Dr. Silly was in charge of it. So a person who had been on one of the committees with Dr. Silly, you know, as a student, said, you know, let's do something to honor him. So, you know, our committee decided, and basically my speech was around um, calling him to stage as a surprise. We made sure Randy got him there, and we presented him a silver tray with the embossed seal of college saying to Dr. Richard Silly, physician and friend. And, you know, and President Graves figured it out as I was in the commencement line, and I had this big thing under my arm. He said, no surprises? I said, well, nothing that I'll embarrass. And I really, I never thought of it as, I just never thought of that. I should run that past. Of graves that we were going to do that, um, but it, it went off okay. My speech was weird because not only was I really nervous and didn't want to speak, but I got the Sullivan Award right before, and I was like, "What's going on?" Um, so you know, I was. I, have, I mean, basically, I said, "Thanks everybody for coming." Um, I remember saying something about community and excellence and words that really turned out to be weird is that sometimes when you honor someone else that we were getting ready to do for Dr. Silly that it says much about the people giving the award as it does the recipient of the award. So it displays our values and what's important to us. And just having gotten an award, it just really... Seemed weird, and if I had known I was getting that award, and now they tell you in advance you're getting them. 
Um, if I had known I was getting that, I probably would not have made a statement like that. But, yeah. The speech, Lynn Dillon, who's now on the Board of Visitors, um, I, I remember her comment. It was so funny. After commencement, we said, that was the short, greatest speech <laughs> ever. I said, I know it was short. And our speaker, Kim Ann Brewster, had gone on really, really, really long, so short was really <laughs> appreciated. But President Graves was awesome. And um, the, the story I was grasping for was, you know, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. My whole life was planned around being a lawyer. My grandfather, my namesake, the person who funded, had planned for me to be a lawyer from the day I was born, first grandson. And... Um, even like partners in his firm and people who worked for him knew from when I was a little kid I was eventually going to take over his law practice. And so no pressure, um, especially when I decided not to go to law school. Um, no pressure. And um, I got a call during, I took the, what are they called, the LSATs, did poorly, and my grades were ter you know, terrible, and I knew I wasn't going to get in anywhere. So I went through the motions of applying to the University of Richmond. At that time, it was, I wanted to stay in Virginia. Uh, it was probably the easiest of the law schools to get in at the time. And I knew I wouldn't even get in there. But I would go through the motions and keep my grandfather at bay for a while and then say, oh, I can't be a lawyer because I can't get in. Well, I get a call during Christmas break from the University of Richmond Law School Admissions Department. And saying, you know, we encourage you to take your LSATs again because decisions are going to be made and normally people go up the second time. Um, so I said, do you call everybody? What? This seems like a weird call to me. And they said, well, we have a letter of recommendation here that is, you know, very compelling. And I said, I haven't even sent in recommendations. They said, well, we have one from the President William Mary. I said, really? I said, he does, I don't think he even knows. He said, well, he, he knows. I said, what does it say? <laughs> and he said, basically, ignore the kid's scores. Just, if he wants to be a lawyer, he'll be a great lawyer. And so I came back after winter break to President Graves. I said, President Graves, did you write a letter recommendation? He said, yeah. Like, all excited, I'm like, yeah. Um, and I went, you're ruining my life. I don't want to go. I don't want to go to law school, Professor. You are ruining my life. I have this whole plan on how to get out of going to law school. And he goes, "Well, sorry." And apparently, Jane—I don't know what her last name was—but she was his administrative support, like executive secretary kind of person. And you know, every time you had to wait for him for a meeting, yeah, you know, we chat chat about what we're going to do. And I must have mentioned law school, and she thought it would be a nice gesture, so she went to Professor Graves. I said, "Why don't you?" Okay, great idea. Um, so I didn't really handle that one great. I just said, well, thank you, but, and I just said, well, you're ruining my life. Um, so, I mean, that's the kind of person, you know, he was. He was, he had a really hard job coming in as a person, um, a Yankee, when we'd been a very Southern school, um, a liberal in the eyes of the conservatives. And I thought he, was a really wonderful president, but more important, he was a wonderful person. And he really cared about the students here. And he became president as we entered as freshmen. So just like I have this affection for the class of 2015, because in staying connected, they were the first class that really we had full time, and they went all through four years with us. That's what President Gray's relationship was like, was like with us, you know, as a senior class. It was pretty special. He's awesome. Um, I know from talking with some current students that there's um, sometimes appears to be a lot of pressure on them today to be part of Greek life. And um, I wonder if you can discuss the kind of the campus culture around that from your time period, if that was a big, um, you know, if, if Greek life was as big of a deal then as it appears to be um, today. Yeah, I actually asked some people about um, in the administration about this a couple months ago. And I think the percentage was, yeah, a little bit higher, maybe three to five percent higher than it is currently. Um, but it was still like a third or less of the campus. And there was a shift between when I was an undergraduate and then when the residence halls program 
came in and I became area director because with programming being such an emphasis of residence halls programming in 75 to 77, people saw less of a difference between Greek life and campus life because there was more going on in residence halls. But when I was here as a student, um, Greek life, even if they were only 30 some percent of the people, it's what you heard about all the time. And that was where the social life was. But uh, I never joined. I went, I started Rush and just felt like I might be limiting myself to the number of people I can interact with. And I like all people. So yeah, I, I just didn't go through. I went on the assumption I would join a fraternity because my dad was in a fraternity. And I think everybody expected was, and my older sister was a big sorority person, president sorority. But yeah, it just didn't, just didn't appeal to me. Um, weirdest thing was that when I became area director later, um, I had a student who rushed Lambda Chi and wanted me to be his big brother. And like friends from Lambda Chi called and said, you know, what's this all about? I said, I don't know. And he, so they said, well, you know, Van's not even in Lambda Chi. And Van works for the college. <laughs> he's not like a brother. And he's not, um, you know, he can't be your big brother. He's, he's not even in Lambda Chi. And the student said, oh, he's at all the parties. <laughs> So I went to lots of fraternity parties where I had friends, and I had friends all over the place, so I went to lots of fraternity parties. <laughs> but the poor kid, who's now a doctor, um, he, he thought, you know, I should be his big brother because that's what I was like in his dorm as, like, he thought, like, RA, you know. So that was pretty funny. But heavy social. You know, remember the drinking age was 18 when we were here, which is a huge difference. Um, so most of the social life centered around Greek life. And all of us could still participate. We all had friends. But it's a little different now, a lot more rules, a lot more litigious world, a lot more scrutiny. So. Um, you mentioned um, some challenges. I wonder if you could expand on you know, any challenges you faced while at William & Mary. Me personally? Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Uh, academics was my biggest challenge by far. Um, I, you know, if they hadn't had that predictive study, I would not be at William & Mary, and I probably would have been like a superstar at a lot of other places from an, even an academic standpoint. Um, but it was really hard, hard for me. And I worried about academics all the time. And that was by far the biggest challenge. Really, life was pretty easy for me outside of that. Um, I felt like I really thrived here, especially junior and senior year. Um, getting to be senior class president, you know, was an unexpected great thing because the way I do work, the way I do everything is, hey, you're going to do this, you're going to commit to it full blast. So I got to know so many classmates that I had never met or just seen on campus before. Um, got them engaged in a lot of things that, you know, we always, yeah, you'd always sit around and talk, why didn't somebody do this? Why doesn't somebody do that? So we went and did all those, you know, did those kinds of things. But yeah, I can't think of too many other challenges. I think freshman year, um, just living with a group of people and people who are really different, you know, from each other. And I never drank and certainly never had done drugs at the time and being exposed to some of that kind of stuff, you know, it was like, hmm, just made you be, you know, just made you think about what you want to be as a person and what you want college to be. Uh, but it was, it was never really that difficult. I just made my choices and decided to join or not join, whatever. You know, I've always sort of been a very, you know, I understand myself, my good and my bad. <laughs> and I make choices accordingly. Uh, but, but really, there weren't lots. And maybe my uh, convenient memory is blocking out some, but really, I, um, I don't think it was a big deal for me. Yeah. Um, so what did you and your classmates do for fun? Both um, on campus and off campus. Yeah, didn't spend a lot of time off campus, ever. I mean, went to Sal's Pizza all the time. And we, um, we just really sort of enjoyed each other's company. We had volleyball games. and But, you know, sitting around talking was half of what we did. We, once residence hall started doing programming, there was more stuff that we did together. 
But like Camp Third, where I lived for three years and was the RA for two years, um, we're having a 40th reunion of Camp Third as a part of um, Homecoming. And there's, in Cam, I don't know what it is, when the physical building's the same, but there were only 18 people who lived on that hall, and probably 11 or 12 of us were seniors, and seven of us still keep in touch with each other all the time. So, you know, we had lots of late night conversations, and we'd take road trips all the way to the hospitality house, like right across the street, for, you know, dollar pizza, I mean, dollar spaghetti and meatball night. And Sal's Pizza was one of her favorites, and Frank truck, Frank's Truck Stop, which now is a Mexican restaurant, was open, I assume, all night, but maybe just till two or three or something like that. And we made a lot of trips out, out to Frank's. Um, and one thing about sorority, um, sorority life in protection, Greek life that you mentioned, or you asked about, was um, pledge dances were a big social gig. And they were always in the campus center, the current campus center, ballroom which is now student government offices and always had live bands and there were nine sororities so like at least nine times you know you could go to a formal dance you know homecoming my senior year we had the platters and I don't know if you remember know who them are you probably know some of their songs we actually had the platters instead of a band we had the platters give like performance and dance sort of evening at the same time. We had concerts on campus. Yeah, we had great concerts on campus. Um, James Taylor to this day is my still favorite performer, and part of that was seeing him live twice at two years in a row at Wayne and Mary. So, you know, concerts, when you, when you take into um, people who took advantage of William and Mary Theater, William and Mary Choir, to me, there was always something to do but you had to take advantage of it. And lots of times you went because your friends were in it as much as it was because you had interest in the arts. Like I remember when, uh, to this day I can still see, I saw a poster on campus, um, or maybe it was in town this week, about Shakespeare, um, what's that group, this, what's the Shakespeare Festival during the summer? I saw something about Antony and Cleopatra. And to this day, I remember um, Glennie Wade, who, Glenn Close, being Cleopatra, and Antony and Cleopatra, and just being mesmerized by who was this person. And I knew, you know, who, who in theater doesn't want to be a superstar someday? And she was really amazing. But, you know, what's the chance of somebody who's going to make it? And I remember <laughs> going to see The World According to Garp, and which, where she got her first Oscar nomination. And in the beginning of the movie, it's just her face you know, on the screen, it was like, oh my God, I know this person. <laughs> this is a way better person, I know this person. But to me, there's still a whole lot of people who looking back would say there wasn't a social life if they weren't in a Greek organization, but I say bunk to that. It was there. It certainly isn't like now where there's everything every minute of the day. I mean, I don't know how people decide what to do around here. Um, and students probably don't even think that, you know. But I, I, I sort of say bunk. It was there if you wanted it to be there. I want to kind of get back to the topic of student activism, which you touched on earlier as kind of one of the reasons you wanted to come to William & Mary is because the you know, students weren't necessarily as engaged with student activism as other campuses. And again, this being the early 70s, you know, um, the civil rights movement of the 60s and um, you know, Vietnam and everything, a lot of the probably the most vocal protest had, had passed, but at the same time, you know, Nixon's pulling troops out of Vietnam, and Jane Fonda goes to North Vietnam, and you have, you know, Watergate, and, you know, so if there wasn't an active, you know, presence of student activism on campus, then what was the culture like? Because I still consider this, or think of this as a conservative campus even uh -huh. today. Um, where students I know from social media have opinions that may go against the grain, but they're not publicly outside of social media, right, right. you know, expressing that. Um, whereas at, at a more well, liberal see, that's university, a, you might have different. that's a huge difference too. Is that we don't we didn't have any of that kind of technology. So I think if you were politically inclined and motivated, that 
you probably, if you had that person sitting in this chair, they may have a completely different end view of life. And I think they were certainly our hallway conversations we had about those kinds of things. Um, and it was probably a subset of the campus, but it, it wasn't a prevailing part of the campus. So athletics was the big one. And another, and the other one, and it wasn't controversy, but it was sign of the times changing, was all around um, visitation and self-determination. Because when we were freshmen, you had to, you know, women had, or men had to be introduced into a woman's dorm. And we had house mothers um, protecting us. And um, President Graves brought a change to that within his first year and to the whole concept which still exists about self-determination. And so there was some controversy um, about that, not from the student body, but more from like the legislature. You know, you know, some of the very conservative legislators, what's going on? You know, the world's going to hell because these students can visit each other in the dorms. But you know, it's it's pretty pretty calm here. My guess is in student government meetings or in board of student affairs meetings, there was probably more controversy about it. But I really wasn't a, a part of those. But um, you know, I was a government major, but I would say um, not really a political kind of person. So my antenna really wasn't a big deal up about that. Um, so I know there are pockets of it, pockets of it, but it just wasn't part of my big life while I was here. Always interested, like, you know, and the Nixon resignation and Watergate and stuff like, sort of happened primarily during the summer when nobody was here. So I can remember going to the campus center um, personally, basically every day when I was here for summer school, you know, seeing, okay, what's the latest hearing and the Rosemary Woods and the missing 18 seconds of tape. But oh, I, I can remember all those kinds of things. But like nobody was around. So it wasn't really a big deal. But I bet you you get other people in this chair, and they would have a completely different view of that one. It just wasn't my world experience, you know, while I was here. Um, trying to think of other kinds of big things. No, and it, and it you know, could be my uh, rose-colored memory also. Yeah. Okay. Um, we well, kind of touched on my next question, which um, relates to when President Graves ended the student body curfew. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about that because for a long time, well, since women were admitted to William & Mary, they were under a totally different set of rules and regulations than the male students in terms right. of their dress um, and the rules governing whether they could even be out in public with yeah, I love male looking at student, those pictures. You know, without a chaperone. Yeah. Um, Students and, love hearing stories from people pre my era. And it's only a couple <laughs> years before my era when they have lots of those stories. And so the fact that this curfew was in place up until, you know, like 71, 72, um, you know, did that curfew apply Freshman those days year. to just women or to all students or just to freshmen or do you recall? Hmm. Well, the visitation stuff, in my memory, only lasted the first semester and maybe the second semester of freshman year. But pretty much the first semester, that changed. Because I remember that we had to have permission slips when we came as incoming freshmen as to whether or not we could have any visitation at all announced or not. And there were a group of people who didn't get their forms in, so they had to live on a hall that, you know, no visitation whatsoever. Of course, that didn't really happen. But, um, but that all changed as soon as President Graves came in, and that changed. So I don't know. We had visitation kinds of things we had to approve, even as men on campus. But the real rules were protecting the women <laughs> from us. Uh, so, like, talk to any of my classmates about what freshman like freshman year was like. But it ended pretty quickly. So for us, it was like funny and a nuisance and irritating. But for people the years before us, I mean, it was a hot button. You know, it was a hot button for them. But dress, we didn't have any of those beanies. And, yeah, that was all gone by the time we got here. Um, but yeah, so we were in the tail end. You know, we, we, that's like post-Vietnam. We were post, you know, all those kinds of things. So um, 
You mentioned earlier too, talking about the dorms, some being either either male or female, and then eventually it became co-ed. So did, yeah. um, at the time you arrived, were all dorms either one or the other? Yes. And then before you... And you know, freshmen lived off, they had a large, and we called it James Boy Terrace JBT, and it's now like a storage facility out past the baseball fields. We had freshmen live out there. Oh, well, yeah. Freshmen lived out there. Oh, freshmen lived out there, and they all had a bond about... You know, and they had to take the green machine in. Yeah, you know, I'm sure there was a good reason at the time, but you know, it's all in context. But oh my God, putting freshmen out there, you know, for their initial college experience, I just can't envision it. So I lived the, in Yates' basement. Well, so when the dorms became, or you had the opportunity to have co-ed dorms, was there like a sense of, you know, for, again, I don't want to say freedom to make it sound really dramatic, but. Um, just kind of like you felt like finally we're able to, you know. Um, first of all, when I was undergraduate, so for my four years of undergraduate, the only co-ed housing that existed um, was if there was an academic purpose attached to it. Such as? Such as we had a, th the first co-ed housing I'm aware of was called Project Plus. And it's like in the Botetot unit seven and eight or six and seven, whatever. Yeah. And... Now they all have names, instead of numbers. Um, but it, there was an academic theme and people who had interest in living together. Um, so like, if you've been in those complexes, they are alternating floors, they're attached, but all the women were on side, all the men were on one side, but all the common areas were common. But you had to have an academic purpose to um, have co-ed housing. After, and Project um, Plus People, to this day, um, are a very close-knit bunch uh, and still very active within the class of 75 at least. So we were the first group that was in part of Project Plus. I wasn't a part of it. Um, and then after that, academic purposes were things like, I think there was a French house and a Spanish house, also in Botetot. So it was like Botetot got to be where the academic purpose co-ed housing was. But as I described it, this is how it was set up. Co-ed housing for non-academic purpose didn't happen until I was area director. And they had, um, so that was immediately after my graduation, Bryan Complex became the place on campus that had co-ed housing. Um, and so floor by floor on two, in half of Bryan Complex, um, in Bryan itself and in Madison, two of the five dorms, Bryan being the biggest one, there was co-ed housing, and it was different sides of the hallways, you know, so their own bathrooms and those kinds of things. But the bit about sense of freedom and relief, um, I don't remember it being that way. I remember people just saying, well, it's about time. Not the sense of freedom, you've been repressing us. I think it was like, well, this is just such so normal. You know, why isn't the whole world like this? Um, and it was, you know, it was so successful, but it was like, how could you not think it was going to be successful? And there was concerns about in doing Brian Complex with non-academic purpose. <laughs> I was tease about that. See, Sam Sadler's still like, academic purpose. What's that got to do with anything? Um, because I was the area director in charge of implementing co-ed housing in Brian, and I was three months away from, I had just graduated. So they had concern about me being hired, first of all, and then trusting co-ed housing with it. But it was like, okay, it was awesome. It was, it was never an issue. In fact, I think probably, Sam Sal would be able to tell you, but I think probably there was less damage. There was, you know, damage, broken windows. You know, it was just normal. So, And so now it's, I don't even know how they do it now. It's all co-ed or mainly co-ed in most places. Continue on then with the um, time you served as an area director. Um, so after you graduated, you worked for two years as an area director yeah. at William and Mary. So can you go into detail and describe what your primary duties were? Yeah, sure. A um, little, a little context for you. Um, this sounds like senior class president. Um, I applied to be the area director, and because th by then the residence hall system was two years, you know. Um, Morris Ray only lasted one year as the dean, and then a guy named Jack Morgan came in. 
and really started beefing up the organ, you know, the residence hall program, the the qualifications of the people who were able to be area directors. So you had to have had like a master's degree. So there used to be house mothers, and then you had suddenly had to have a master's degree and some work experience before you could be an area director in charge of a bunch of dorms. But I applied to be an area director, and I was told, no, you can't apply. And I said, it says two years of experience or equivalent, or master's degree two years or equivalent. And I said, I helped found Inner Hall. I've been an RA, I've been a dorm council president. I mean, I'm sort of like the student face of residence halls around here. You know, I can see where you would say you're not gonna hire me, but to say I can't apply, yeah, I'm not so excited about that. So long, really long story short, um, um, they insisted I couldn't apply. So I went to Vanderbilt to interview for the same job. And Vanderbilt is where Mars Ray came from and where we based a lot of our best practices on from a residence hall standpoint. And they offered me the job at Vanderbilt. So I came back and said, now help me understand why I can't apply here, but I can get hired at the place that we're modeling our practices off of. And I was told no. So I went to Sam Sadler, who was the boss of the residence hall people, and a couple days later I became the area director. <laughs> Um, and it's another one of those things which is like, that just doesn't make sense, you know. I'm, I have a trouble when things don't make sense and people can't explain why it makes sense. Um, still as an adult. But, you know, so that's how I became the area director. Um, but again, I was never nervous about it. It was, it was just going to be easy. And it, it was a joy. But the responsibilities are, you're managing, I had five dorms in Bryan Complex, Old Dominion, um, Monroe, and then all of the lodges, some of which don't even exist anymore. We're all residents also. That was my area of responsibility. So I selected and trained and managed all of the RAs and all of those facilities, was in charge of all programming, and was in charge of the discipline, coaching the hall councils, that kind of stuff. Um, I lived in, as area director, I lived in the little apartment in Old Dominion first floor. And because of my own interest in career development and service, my apartment had this teeny little sliding door that had a teeny little office, which most people wouldn't even say is a closet. But instead of using that, I turned that into a self-help career center. So anytime there was information about jobs, we worked with the career development, which was one person in a little room itself. But any interest about um, career exploration, all those kinds of things, this was like a self-help career center. It was amazing the amount of um, coaching and counseling that I could do just by the drop-ins and who's you know in there looking at pamphlets and things like that. So it sure wasn't sophisticated, but um, it was part of our programming effort. Uh, the other thing is, you know, most places had dorm council dues to run the programming. And I don't remember us having those, we probably did. But what I do remember is that we got pinball machines. We, we talked to a vendor of pinball machines to put pinball machines in um, all of our main lobbies and then we would split the profits with them to fund programming and reduce or eliminate even if we had them you know dorm dues so that was all really great unless you lived in the lobby <laughs> and people would come down and play pinball at two and three and four in the morning because they were tired of studying <laughs> that was a very very noisy sort of life um, but it was just one of those outside the box sort of things that we did to try to one raise revenue and give people some stuff to do but um, probably the biggest um, programming event and one that I uh, was against and my graduate resident pushed back on me was around the presidential debate um, Greg Campbell the most enthusiastic person to this day that I've ever met. I would love to see what he's doing. Um, I know he's an attorney. I'm sure he's an attorney because he was in law school. Most enthusiastic and upbeat and positive person. He gets like full responsibility for the biggest successes that we have, uh, we ever had in Bryan Complex. Uh, one for the presidential debate. Um, and you saw pictures in the slideshow. This is uh, 
Carter and yeah, Ford. Jimmy Carter and Jerry Ford were running for president, and the president mm-hmm. the presidential debate was held at William and Mary in Phi Beta Kappa Hall, and then broadcast into William Mary Hall for masses of people to see. But um, Greg had this idea that we were going to build a banner that was the whole size of the front of Brian, and we would have the We Mary Pep Band or whoever they were at the time playing, and we'd have balloons and we'd have little speeches. And I liked all those things except the banner. What a stupid idea. Um, and he said, no, boss, it's going to be great. He always called me boss. And he was older than me. Um, and so he wore me down, basically, because I thought, oh, this is silly. And it's probably one of the greatest things that they ever did on this campus um, at that time. It was such a community builder. It really brought you know the political um, world to us in a very positive way. TV crews were here made national you know pictures and things like that greg just managed the whole layout design managing all the it was awesome and um so i guess it was good that i let him <laughs> convince me what i thought oh god this is a terrible idea and it probably was also that i have waste too much on my plate i don't need something this big to worry about but really he said i'll take it and i'll run with it the other thing greg um ran was we had uh, every semester we had campus-wide co-ed volleyball tournaments so we, we get like 60 teams from across and we had greek teams and we had dorm teams and um, that was where you could start seeing the the that there are more social and recreational opportunities for people in residence halls you just didn't have to be in greek life you know to this we had parties all the time and volleyball turns all the time recreational all the time speakers all the time at least in Brian complex we did and um, Greg ran all of those kinds of things. And there's slides that show the brackets. And it was a big deal. And it was on clockwork. Your game's done. OK, new team, come in here. OK, you two win. You go over there. You know. But there was also king parties <laughs> throughout the whole. But yeah, we had a lot of stuff going on in, in Bryan Complex. So was your commitment for two years, or was it time to move on after two years? It was. Um, there was no length of the commitment. I had started graduate school in counseling when I was here. But I quickly learned about myself that I could not go to school and work full time, that I had to make a choice. So I got like 12 hours under my belt over two years in the um, higher ed program here, maybe. I don't even know what program it was. Uh, But it was in School of Education. And then um, left after two years and finished my master's degree at JMU uh, full time. So I had enough credits that I could do it in a 12-month cycle. And I wouldn't have my master's degree at this point if I had tried to work. Because given a choice, I always chose work. Um, And I've never been a great student, never really liked the academic setting um, or the classroom. I just don't like studying. I'm a very bad representative of the William Mary academic culture. Yeah. You know, it just flashed back. during Staying Connected, one initiative we had, I, don't, I, th- I think they still have it. It's called, um, what's it called? Show Day during orientation. It's a half a day, students helping out Williamsburg. Um, and everybody goes and does a community service kind of project for a half a day during orientation, freshmen. So that's something they do now. But as part of Staying Connected, we brought alums in to meet and work with the students. And so a couple of us joined them in some of their community <laughs> service groups. And when I got to my assigned table, it was Tom Rideout, who's head of Tri Partners, and I. Um, he's a new not honorary alum from William and Mary. But um, we had about 20 minutes. We're just you know sitting there, and the students don't know each other, and they're nervous. And so I said, you know, you know, I'm an alum. You know, I do a lot of work here. What do you, you know? What kind of questions, to, you know, could I answer for you? And the very first question was, what's the lowest grade you ever got at William Mary? And I said, I can tell you are a William and Mary student. Only a William Mary student would ask that question as the very first question. And they say, yeah, but what's the answer? And I went, an F. <gasps> and like, everybody like, oh, the students were like, oh, <laughs> you got an F? I said, and I earned that F. <laughs> I, deserve, I deserve that F. But it was like, how did you get to like graduate? If you, it was like, just the naivete of incoming <laughs> freshmen, and they think that everybody gets all A's in the world because they've always gotten all A's in the world. 
Um, it was pretty funny. Um, let's switch gears just a little bit. Um, just things is a, an important topic to, to ask about um, while I have the opportunity. So, you know, um, in 1970, there were about 40 African American students at William and Mary. By 1977, there were at least two African American faculty members. And the Office of Minority Affairs was established in 1974. So I wonder if you can describe for me, just based on what you observed or participated in, what the relationship was like between you know, white and African American students during the four years you were both um, an undergraduate and then the two years where you were. Yeah, even by 76, even though we had, uh, um, like Leroy Moore, Leroy Moore was the Minority Affairs person who started in 74, um, still the, the minority population was very, very small. Um, and the minority students that I knew, I had you know good relationships with, but they were few and far between to have relationships with. Uh, going back to my senior year, when we chose graduations, and we voted on graduation speaker, Thurgood Marshall was our choice. And it was really a statement on our part that we might need to do something about uh, broader representation. And um, I got a letter back from Thurgood Marshall because President Graves allowed me to, another good President Graves thing, allowed me to write a letter in addition to his letter inviting him to be speaker. And I remember, well, first of all, being shocked that I got an answer, and I'm sure his secretary dictated it, or he dictated it to his secretary, but it said, never have I wanted to be a speaker more than <laughs> the case you made for why I should come to William & Mary. And my whole appeal was, we are behind the times. We need to change that William & Mary. He said, but I don't accept any speaking engagements because once I accept one, the floodgates will open. So was bummed out, but our number two choice was Coretta Scott King. So it was really a statement on you know, our part that, you know, this is something we may need to grapple with. And one of the minority students um, is, I just don't know where Reggie is right now, but Reggie Clark was on my hall and was a national champion in the half mile. And so um, some of the minority students we got to know, we got to know through him and his friends in athletics. And he was um, uh, a president's aide with us. So it's funny that this question sort of ties in together a lot of other things. But still, it was just, I, I, I probably have just generic empathy for that situation because that's sort of who I am, but I didn't know that many minority students and there weren't that many to know. Um, Mickey Weishurst got the Sullivan Award, a minority female who is at either MCV or VCU and um, she's a physician. Um, she got the Sullivan Award with me at commencement. Um, but I didn't know her that well. But um, I really just love seeing campus being so much broader now, not only minority populations, international populations, uh, and, and I've actually worked with Center of Student Diversity and a lot of those individual groups, because um, to me it's just a more normal world. Um, in my work life, when I was a VP of Human Resources at a company in um, Delaware, we started a child care center, and it ended up the company got rid of the child care center. But I quit my job and saved it and took it over to make sure it didn't close. And we were in a, it wasn't in the um, company, it was like a half a mile away at an old church building that the company had renovated to um, save it for the church, but also get a really cheap lease. And when I took it over, we changed the mission of the center to represent the community that we lived in. And the community we lived in had you know, a lot of single moms, a lot of minority population, and that it was, it was interesting. We offered scholarships to students so that we could have a broader representation. We um, enabled parents to work off their tuition. So there's things in childcare that are non-skilled times like open period when parents are coming and picking up their kids and kids are riding bikes and playing in the playground that we offered um, any family who couldn't afford the tuition to work off the time by just supervising the non-skilled times. And it was fascinating to me to watch who came into our center to look at the center and who ended up coming to the center. 
because there were pure biases. There were some who would come in who were academic elite, financially elite. They would see this broad, diverse representation, and it wasn't for them. And there were other families who grew up in those kinds of neighborhoods and appreciated diversity who just thought it was the greatest place you know, in the world. So um, I think my time here really opened my eyes to a lot of that, but there wasn't a lot of it really to, to experience. And I just love it the way it is now. So looking back, <clears throat> is there anything you wish you could do over? You know, people will jump on me if they ever see this, but, you know, if I were doing it all over again, I probably wouldn't be at William Murray. Because I would, if I knew how hard it was, I probably would have said, I'm not willing to put in that, especially if I'm not going to get any academic reward for it. I, I probably wouldn't have come. And that would have been a terrible thing in my life, not to, because lifelong friends and the most wonderful people I've ever known. Um, you know, and I've been really blessed a couple times in my life as an exchange student to be surrounded by, that was my first exposure to, oh my God, there are just like really bright, wonderful people my age out there. You know, I had all my friends in high school and stuff, but this was different when I was an exchange student and met these kids from all over the country. It was, and, the, and plus to be on your own in a foreign country, I mean, there's so much growth that comes out of that. Um, when I went to GE, when I worked for GE, the people were remarkably smart, gifted, talented, driven, and my time at William & Mary. You know, three times I've been really blessed to be surrounded by wonderful people. And I know that I do better and I function better when I'm surrounded by those kinds of people. And so, to me, I probably wouldn't be here, and that would have been terrible. Staying connected, people ask me, would you do it over? And the answer is probably no. If I had known <laughs> how much time it was going to take and how big it was going to become, I would have overanalyzed, and I would have said, that's a great idea. God bless somebody who does that. But I probably would have talked myself out of it. Um, but I tend to be a person who leads from the heart and then uses the brain to figure out how to make that happen. So that was an impulsive decision. Um, and I probably would have overanalyzed and talked myself out of it. And, and that would have been a terrible thing or a missed. You know, my life is so much richer because I made that, that decision. Last question then. So how um, did, ten, did attending William & Mary influence your life? Oh, uh, for sure. Just the quality of the people here. William & Mary selects, trains, nurtures remarkable people who become even more remarkable you know, while they're here. And that is by far the best part of William & Mary. Now, right now, William & Mary, I guess, I don't even know when it became more of a research university, because it wasn't like that when we were here. Um, but a more research university, the whole commitment to service, the diversity, the international experiences, all those things are remarkable, and none of those things were things that we really had. We had the beginning pieces of them, very small pieces of them. But even with all those remarkable things, to me, for me, it comes down to the people here still. Um, remarkable people who go here, and they don't become any less remarkable when they go out into the working world and, you know, become a you know, older adults. Um, and there's no doubt about that. That's the most wonderful part of William & Mary from my perspective. Um, and because I'm not an academically oriented person, I'm more a social interpersonal, you know, it gave me a chance to really um, interact with remarkable people, help me see the kind of people that I wanted to be, give me role models of people that, you know, I really admired and could learn from. Um, and people say, well, every school's got slugs and slackers. And I go, yeah, maybe we did. I just didn't know who they were. Um, and I tend to see, like, the best in each person. So even if I met one of those persons, <laughs> I would find a way to find the good in those people. Uh, but, you know, a slacker at William & Mary is probably a pretty good person in a whole lot of other universities. Um, so the people's, though the biggest thing here.
Anything else you'd like to add? No. 